admit it, we are living in amazing times. And that's good news and bad news. On the good news side, did you know that hunger is at the lowest point ever in our humanity? It has dropped from 40% in the 1980s to 10% now. Even violence, mass violence, that is, you wouldn't know it from watching the news, but in reality, it's at its lowest point ever as well. But we also know we have enormous challenges, challenges the size of humanity itself, you know, like global warming and financial instability and pollution like plastic in the food chain and inequities and on and on. On top of that, technology is acting as an accelerant and as a disruptor. And so this is really magnifying the challenges that are ahead of us. Part of the challenge is related to unemployment. According to very credible estimates, about 30% of jobs will be replaced by technology in the coming decade. This is certainly the stuff of grave concern. No job will be left untouched, even if it doesn't get replaced wholesale, will have to adapt in enormous ways. So, for instance, if you look at medicine, Jobs that are high-end are also going to be impacted. We're not only talking about jobs that are repetitive physically or intellectually. We're talking about high-end jobs where patterns need to be sought and understood. Part of these patterns might be X-ray interpretation, slideware interpretation, interpretation in pathology, and other diagnostics like cancer where machines can actually do better, already do better, than physicians. So it's not only the low end that causes us concern, even the high end is. And with that comes the fear of perhaps mass unemployment and mass social unrest. Social unrest can actually start even at 15% unemployment. It doesn't have to reach m massive proportions to, er to emerge. And this is what we need to pay attention to. This is when people get into concerns of strange behaviors and strange voting patterns. But if we take a step back and we understand that technology can also help us, we have a more balanced views of it all. The balanced view is, yes, we have to be concerned about what it does to us, but we also have to keep in mind that it, provokes, it provides affordances to us. We can start using technology to learn better. I'm giving you examples here. At first, it will be very sl small slivers of an education. For example, automated essay grading. Eventually, it will be more adaptive learning. And even better, eventually, will be personalized learning. So that's great, but personalized learning about what exactly? See, we don't know where the activities will be, the jobs will be, and so on. So we really need to rethink of a new paradigm. It's not only about how we learn and what we learn, but it's about what we learn on a global basis. It's about learning how to learn. And that's where we end, need to end up being. So let's explore this a bit further. Yes, education is about how and what. And for the past 50 or so years, we have all focused on how to teach better. And I grant you, we all want to connect the how with the real world. We all want to do more projects. We want to learn with community involvement. We want to be involved in real world applications. That is all true. But at the same time, we also have to rethink the what of an education. Why should we learn things that are obsolete? What is relevant? If we can search for it, and if we can get algorithms to help us with analysis, do we need to know it? What's relevant? So here's a potential strategy. In a world where you don't know what the future holds for you, a world that's volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. Wouldn't a wise strategy be that of versatility? Whatever life throws at me, I'll be able to adapt. 
like a Swiss Army knife. I have a variety of tools. I may not have the best tool possible, but it's a good enough tool for any job that comes my way. And yes, over time, I can learn to refine that tool, sharpen it, and become better at it. So a broad, strong base, and then a deep base that gets developed over time as the need arises. Well, in a sense, I've described a Renaissance human, a physicist who is also a poet, who is also a painter. And with that, all the skills and character quality that are associated with this. So it's not only someone who's good at science and technology and mathematics, but also someone who's good at humanity and arts and know how to bring all these things together, someone who knows how to learn. So this means we have to rethink knowledge. What is relevant knowledge? How do we modernize knowledge? There are two possible ways to go at it, both of which are necessary. The first part is to think through what are the existing disciplines. Why, for instance, do we teach so much trigonometry in an age that doesn't require as many land surveyors and woodworkers? Why do we teach so little statistics and probabilities in a world that requires understanding life and employability? After all, it is a world of big data. So why, why wouldn't we all know how to manipulate it? And then, of course, technology engineering. It's pervasive. It's pervasive in all our jobs, whether we like it or not. So why wouldn't we be teaching technology and engineering for everybody? Why wait only until university? Why wouldn't we all know how to code? Why wouldn't we all understand biotech? That seems to be normal nowadays. And it's not only that. Other modern disciplines, such as entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is actually the job of the future. We don't know where the jobs will be, so we can map to where the opportunities will be. And that is entrepreneurship. But knowledge alone is not enough. Knowledge alone can remain inert. Skills are how we use that knowledge. So when we talk about skills, well, let me give you an example. Ebola. There's an outbreak, and all of a sudden, what you've learned about exponentials in mathematics has to come alive. So you have to learn how to think critically and creatively. How am I going to deal with this disease? Who do I involve? What's at stake? How many doctors do I recruit? What are the solutions? Uh, do I involve the families or not? Your communication skills will come really handy. How do I explain this to the general public? How do I explain this to the families that have a beloved one that's about to die? Your collaboration skills become handy. How do we collaborate across localities, across countries? We're not immune. This disease can propagate everywhere. And then there's the development of character. Character is how we behave and engage in the world. And so alongside knowledge and skills, we also need to develop that sc this character. Character is what makes us uniquely human, and character will be very enduring to automation. So let's continue with this example. Mindfulness. Wouldn't it be great to be mindful of the fact that we're not isolated? We're all interdependent. And with that interdependence comes the fact that we're not immune. The next day, that disease can be anywhere in the world. It's also about curiosity. Curiosity has been what propelled us forward as a humanity. And so why wouldn't we be curious ahead of time to understand how diseases occur and progress, and how would we fight against them? Courage. That's another character quality. How about understanding what it takes to face an enemy like this and perhaps sacrifice your life in fighting it? How about resilience? You are a family and a loved one has died. How do you rebound? Ethics. Why is it that there was not more prevention in poor countries? 
leadership, the reaction time matters greatly. Wouldn't we want enlightened leadership to react really fast when the situation demands it? And then, in addition to knowledge, skills, and character, there's meta-learning. And this is actually the most important, but the least appreciated in education systems. Think about it in your lives. How many times have you had the latitude to stop and reflect and ask yourself, how did I learn? Can I learn in better ways? What processes did I use? Now, why is this so important? Again, in a world where we don't know where the jobs will be or where life is taking us, the ability to reflect and adapt, which is meta-learning, and do so with confidence is at a premium. And so you want this ability to be developed, not just ignored and hoped for. And eventually, this is how it all comes together. Wherever you go in the world and you ask questions to audiences like this one, what should we be learning? You get all sorts of responses from entrepreneurship to technology to various skills like critical thinking to character qualities like courage. They all fit in this 4D model. So it's about learning in 4D. The sorts of things we wish we had learned throughout our schooling, but only learned eventually through life. Well, why not accelerate this process? Because we're going to need these four dimensions of an education for anything that life throws our way, and particularly to face automation. It may seem like a tall order. And yes, it is a challenge. It is not going to be easy. But this is what it's about. Nelson Mandela really inspired us by reminding us that it always seems complicated until it's done. And this is a situation we're going to be in. We have to propagate this change around the world. We have to all learn in 4D. We have to learn how to learn, and we have to prosper. Thank you very much.